Public Relations. Edward L. Bernays. 1945. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 1. The Growth of Public Relations. 9. The Rise of a New Profession, 1919-1929. From the end of World War I to the stock market crash, basic trends and events hasten the development of public relations. The country had moved toward greater liberalism in the late 90s. The people's power had manifested itself in many ways. Now, still greater social responsibility on the part of men in power was demanded by the public. The weapons of publicity were gaining strength. The public's voice had become more audible as a result of the faster and more extensive mass communication that modern technology had created. Speedier and cheaper multiplication of ideas by printing presses accelerated the process. To understand developments in public relations from 1919 to 1929, it might be well to glance at the background of the period. Harding's Back to Normalcy was followed by Keep Cool with Coolidge, and the slogan The Business of America is Business. These, in turn, were followed by the era of the great engineer, Herbert Hoover. Rising price levels heightened economic activity. Increased competition to attract the consumer's interest and his dollar characterized the period. America was on its greatest, speediest upward economic swing. Boom zinged along, boom after boom the Florida boom, the advertising boom, the stock market speculative boom, the expansion of the investment trusts, the amalgamation of big business into bigger business. The battle for more profits and bigger and better business cut across the country between industries and within them. Oranges fought prunes, tea battled coffee, wool clashed with cotton. Large and small aggregates of business recognized the need to persuade the publics on which they depended for business and goodwill. During the war, these publics had been wooed effectively by government. Now the activity of persuasion was in the hands of an expanding profession. Men and movements of all kinds decided that perhaps words could win their wars, too, in the battle of publicity and of the newer public relations now emerging. An important factor in developing the climate of public opinion was the demonstration to the peoples of the world in World War I that wars are fought with words and ideas as well as with arms and bullets. Businessmen, private institutions, great universities all kinds of groups became conditioned to the fact that they needed the public, that the great public could now perhaps be harnessed to their cause as it had been harnessed during the war to the national cause, and that the same methods could do the job. Now the publicity man was to come into his own on a much broader basis. As Roger Babson stated, the war taught us the power of propaganda. Everybody could see that publicity had helped to win the war. As a result, the post-war period ushered in a conscious expansion of the field. Some of the men who had worked on the Committee on Public Information realized this fact, as did others who had been engaged in various wartime promotional activities for the government. When they left government service and returned to civilian life, these men applied the publicity methods they had learned during the war, refining their methods and broadening the scope of their operations as the expanding post-war economy and the increasing complexity of their publics demanded. There was, for instance, John Price Jones, a former New York newspaper man. As a member of the Committee on Public Information, he had successfully carried out the spirited Liberty Loan selling campaigns through mass persuasion and distribution. After the war, he opened an office and applied his technique to raising funds for universities, such as Harvard, by the same methods and with equal success. Today these methods and techniques are standard practices all over America. When I left the CPI in 1919, it was logical that, with my pre-war experience in publicity and press agentry and my wartime CPI experience, I should follow a similar pattern of activity. With Doris E. Fleischmann as my associate, I began working in the public relations field. We called our activity publicity direction. That was the best name we could think of at the time. We knew the term press agent, of course, but it had bad connotations. Publicity was too indefinite. At least direction seemed to give greater dignity to our work and indicated that we were interested in the planning and directing phases of the field the broad approach to the problem. From 1919 to 1923 our work broadened out, and we came to call it Council on Public Relations, coining the term from the two expressions that best conveyed our meaning. The phrase public relations had already been used by the public utilities and railroads. We combined the idea of public relations with the idea of advisor, substituting the term council for advisor because of its professional connotations. A full-scale history of modern public relations cannot, of course, be presented in a single chapter. But the development of the field can be illustrated by incidents from our own experience incidents which I knew directly and on which I am free to draw. These activities will not give a complete picture. They are presented, rather, as a microcosm, the development of which may serve as an index to the general situation. 
In this connection the reader should keep in mind that at this time we ourselves were groping our way toward present-day public relations, the two-way street aspect of which had not yet been recognized or developed. One of our first clients in 1919 was the War Department, which retained us to help with a publicity campaign designed to deal with the problem of fitting former servicemen into America's everyday life. This problem had become a matter of grave national concern in the spring and summer of that year. As one result of directed national publicity for the War Department's reemployment service, the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce appealed for help to harvest the wheat crop in Kansas. On behalf of the War Department, we prepared a statement about this opportunity for employment. This statement was carried throughout the country as a news dispatch by the Associated Press, and within four days after its appearance the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce wired the War Department that enough labor had been secured to complete the harvest. To publicize the need for reintegrating former servicemen in the normal economic and social relations of the United States, we appeal to the personal and local pride of American businessmen, emphasizing their obligation of honor to rehire their former employees when they were discharged from Army, Navy, Marine, or government service. A citation, to be signed by the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, and the Assistant to the Secretary of War, was prepared for display in the stores and factories of employers who assured the War and Navy departments that they would rehire former employees mustered out of service. We dramatized this citation by arranging with the Fifth Avenue Association to have its members display it simultaneously in their stores. This concerted action on the part of a group of leading businessmen influenced others throughout the United States to re-employ discharged servicemen. In 1919 also, the country of Lithuania sought to become an independent nation, and we were engaged to advise the Lithuanian National Council on ways and means of achieving popular sympathy and an official recognition from the United States. The first problem was to overcome America's indifference to an ignorance about Lithuania and its desires. Here we resorted to the segmental approach that I had introduced into the publicity activities of Diagolov's Russian Ballet. An exhaustive study was made of Lithuania from its remote and contemporary history to its present-day marriage customs and popular recreations. This material was divided into various categories, and each category was addressed to the public to which it was likely to appeal. Many media of communication were employed, to inform ethnologists about Lithuania's ethnic origins, linguists about the development of its language from Sanskrit, sports fans about its athletic contests, women about its clothes, jewelry users about its amber. And while music lovers were given concerts of Lithuanian music, United States senators and congressmen were furnished facts about the country that would give them a basis for favorable action. All avenues of approach to the public were used to arouse interest and stimulate action the mails, the lecture platform, mass meetings, petitions, committees, newspaper advertising, the radio, and motion pictures. As a result of these activities, the public, the press, and government officials became familiar with the character, customs, problems, and aspirations of Lithuania. And Lithuania obtained recognition. Someone called the campaign that achieved this goal advertising a nation to freedom. The term advertising was still used as a synonym for publicity or public relations. We were also employed by the United States Radium Corporation, which had mines in Colorado, to acquaint the public with the discovery that radium was useful in cancer therapy. At our suggestion, The corporation founded the first national radium bank in order to dramatize the fact that radium ought to be available to all physicians who treated cancer patients. In 1920, when radio was still new, the Inner City Radio Corporation, which planned to open a service between New York, Detroit, and Cleveland, engaged us to help win public interest and support for the project. An inauguration ceremony was arranged, at which the mayors of the three cities connected for the first time by radio officiated and the first messages relayed over commercial inner-city radio waves were sent and received by the mayors. The occasion aroused nationwide interest in the new wireless service. That was the year when the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People held its convention in Atlanta, Georgia, dramatizing its fight against lynching by conducting it from the heart of the South. We aided the NAACP in this battle, working closely with James Weldon Johnson, Secretary of the Association, and Walter White, then his assistant. The Overt Act A new concept in the early 20s, was applied when we were asked to help the National Council of American Importers and Traders win public support in its fight against the American valuation section of the Fordney Tariff, which, owing to European currency inflation, would have cut down imports to the United States. To dramatize the adverse effects that American valuation would have on the American consumer, the Consumers Committee of Women Opposed to American Valuation opened on Fifth Avenue an exhibit directed to women. The overt act that made this exhibit news was that its doors were unlocked to the public by Olive Whitman, daughter of Charles S. Whitman, then governor of New York. 
Another example of developments at this time was the campaign of the Beechnut Packing Company to establish in the public mind the fact that the name of its product was synonymous with bacon. It was decided to popularize the slogan Bring Home the Beechnut as a substitute for the folk saying Bringing Home the Bacon by offering awards to the company's salesmen for the best sales made throughout the country during the month of August. To assure the success of the Bring Home the Beechnut contest, a number of nationally known sales managers were chosen to act as judges. Thousands of salesmen competed for the prize, and the slogan was spread all over the United States. In the early 20s we were also consulted by the Hotel Association of New York in regard to counteracting a decline in business. It was believed that the post-war crime wave was keeping visitors away from the city, but our survey revealed that the chief cause of trouble was the common out-of-town belief that the metropolis was cold and inhospitable. As a result of the survey, representatives of New York's leading industrial, civic, and social groups formed the Welcome Stranger Committee. The friendly, hospitable aims of this committee, broadcast throughout the country, helped to re-establish New York's good repute, and congratulatory editorials appeared in both the urban and in the rural press. Another early activity of our organization was aiding in removing taxi cabs of New York from the jurisdiction of a lax, ineffectual license department to the jurisdiction of the police department, which enjoyed the confidence of the public and enforced the law properly. These scattered examples selected from our experience in the early 1920s will perhaps indicate the extent to which the field was changing. There was a growing feeling that, in public relations, words alone were not enough. To arouse and interest the public, words had to be backed by deeds. Publicity direction was becoming more than the use of the mimeograph machine. It was beginning to mean advising the client on the development of attitudes, directions, and even policies that he should follow in order to build goodwill with the public and to realize his social objectives more effectively. By analyzing our experience, we came to see the importance of the two-way street aspect of public relations. That principle was formulated in a book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, written by me and published by Boney and Livright in 1923. It was the first book to deal with the scope and functions of the Public Relations Council. Some of the ideas it explored will bear repeating here because of the impact they had on the public relations field, on persons who were thinking about that field, and on us, who were actively practicing in the field. I believe then and still believe now that public relations can be carried on effectively only on a professional, ethical, and socially responsible basis. Public relations is not a one-way street in which leadership manipulates the public and public opinion. It is a two-way street in which leadership and the public find integration with each other and in which objectives and goals are predicated on a coincidence of public and private interest. At the same time, the Council on Public Relations must not forget his obligations to the public as a special pleader. In that book I undertook further to describe and analyze the scope and functions of the Public Relations Council, the increasing importance of the profession, and the function of the special pleader. I discussed a social science approach to the field, dealing with the nature and dynamics of public opinion, the interaction of public opinion with the forces that help to make it, the relation of public motivation to the work of the Public Relations Council, and the application of these principles to public relations. I also discussed public relations techniques and methods, the group and the herd as basic mechanisms of public change, and outlined practicable methods for modifying group points of view. Just how new the modern profession of public relations council was in the early 20s and how much remained to be done to gain understanding for it may be gathered from the reactions which crystallizing public opinion evoked. These ranged all the way from the acid comment by Melville E. Stone, counselor for the Associated Press, that he knew of no such profession unless it be a self-constituted one to Glenn Frank's and H. L. Mencken's perception that something new and important was developing in the field of public opinion. The publication of this volume did not go unnoticed in business circles. Large corporations called upon us in increasing numbers for advice on matters of policy as well as informational activities. This was a challenge which we had long been preparing to meet and which we were eager to accept. Continuing my attempts to clarify the field and to widen public understanding of it, I conducted a course in public relations at New York University in 1923 the first course in this subject ever offered at any institution of higher learning. It gave students an opportunity to become acquainted with the field, and by giving public relations academic standing, it aided the development of the profession. In 1924 the Overt Act technique reached the White House. We were working with New York's Police Commissioner Rhinelander Waldo in his campaign through the Nonpartisan Committee for the re-election of Calvin Coolidge as President of the United States. We wanted to make it clear to the country in some dramatic way that Coolidge was not the cold, silent iceberg he was supposed to be, that he was really human. It was decided that the President should entertain at breakfast at the White House, his guests for griddle cakes and bacon being Al Jolson, the Dolly Sisters, Charlotte Greenwood, 
and other stage and screen stars. Accounts of this event hit the front pages of newspapers throughout the United States, presenting Coolidge in warmer, more human colors. It also set a pattern for that was the first time a president of the United States had entertained actors and actresses at the White House at breakfast. Another example of the overt act technique was the nationwide soap sculpture contest that Procter and Gamble conducted in 1924 at our suggestion. Thousands of children participated in this contest, which roused interest in art, conditioned young children to cleanliness, and effectively coincided private with public interest. The contest is still held annually. The following year we extended our activities to Europe. Establishing an office in Paris, we made studies of the public relations problems of a number of European industrialists. Among other things, we were engaged as public relations counsel for the Paris Exposition, which was intended to overcome the disillusionment with the French that many Americans had experienced in World War I and to give France new significance in the public mind. In 1926, publicity was a factor in saving the millinery industry. Strategic style propaganda warned off disastrous shift to felt hats, said editor and publisher. Artists and style authorities aided campaign, and editor and publisher discussed the methods we had used to stop the trend to felts and the move to larger hats. The overt act was still being emphasized in our activities to gain public recognition of the organization creating it. One such activity was a French exhibition of works by American artists that I organized for Jacques Seligman, a firm with galleries in New York and Paris. The exhibit aroused interest on the continent, as it did in the United States, because France, up to that time, had not thus honored American artists, and naturally the art dealers who sponsored it acquired goodwill and enhanced reputation. Most of the great American artists then in France exhibited Bob Chandler, Sterling Calder, and Joe Davidson among them. At this time we were also working with a large tobacco company to effect changes in women's fashions in order to facilitate the sale of its cigarette package. We aided luggage manufacturers in doing away with the tradition of scant luggage. We were counseling the New Jersey Bell Telephone Company and Shelton Looms and we gave public relations advice to a new industry, one of the most powerful means of communication ever invented by man radio. Radio was currently facing a problem analogous to the one that public relations had itself experienced. The broad public still thought of radio sets as gadgets for the lower socioeconomic groups. We worked with the Columbia Broadcasting Company. We also initiated a new radio practice in 1928 while acting as public relations counsel for the Dodge Brothers Corporation. When the company launched its new Victory 6, the event was dramatized by the first national radio hookup in history in which screen stars, including Charlie Chaplin, participated. Since the screen was silent, the national hookup gave the public a chance to hear the voices of its favorite performers for the first time. The impact of this broadcast was so great that thousands of persons all over the country stormed into the showrooms of Dodge dealers to see the new Victory 6. The performance that accomplished this goal reached the greatest radio audience any commercial broadcast had commanded up to that time. A high point of our 1929 activities was Light's Golden Jubilee, designed to emphasize the significance of the electric light to American and world civilization. Committees were formed the country over to promote the celebration, holidays were declared, speeches were made, and a commemorative postage stamp was issued by the United States. This stamp honored the inventor of the electric light, Thomas A. Edison, by carrying a picture of a Mazda lamp. Edison, with the assistance of President Herbert Hoover and Henry Ford, reconstructed the electric light at the old laboratory. Edison's voice broke as he read a brief statement in acknowledgement of the tribute paid him. The Jubilee was also marked by Henry Ford's invitation to hundreds of prominent persons to be his guests for several days during the opening of Greenfield Village. And to dramatize the age he had destroyed, Ford had horses and buggies call for his guests. While the Jubilee dramatized the importance of electric light, it had, in addition, a marked impact on the development of public relations. The participation of President Hoover, Henry Ford, Thomas A. Edison, and many other personages in the Jubilee gave public relations a new meaning and new status. The action of the new real estate securities exchange in engaging us to advise them was another indication of the expansion of public relations in the period. Great baking companies, too, were eager to improve their relations with their consumers, employees, purveyors, and the government, and they sought advice on how to deal with these groups in the changing world of the middle 1920s. At the same time, oil companies, couturiers, manufacturers of food and home furnishings, real estate firms, and art dealers wanted advice on how to orient themselves effectively in our complex society. Before they took action, they wanted to have some idea what effect that action might have. They were learning to formulate and plan action that would ensure a desirable result. 
There were still thousands of press agents and publicity men attached to groups and enterprises that had used them for decades hotels, steamship companies, theaters, surfaces, and other segments of the entertainment field who followed the old patterns of press agentry. But business was turning elsewhere. This advance in the recognition of the importance of public relations made itself felt in the activities of large companies, which engaged in one kind of overt act or another to win public understanding or support, employed counsel on public relations, and appointed goodwill or luncheon vice presidents. In the late 20s, industrial leaders set the pace in public relations, others followed the new trend as best they could. Activities in two leading industries illustrate the way in which public relations was expanding. Among the earliest companies to transform the publicity and propaganda lessons of World War I into broader uses for peacetime were the public utilities, the streetcars, and the railroads. As these enterprises emerged from the war, they appointed assistants to presidents in charge of publicity or public relations. To a great extent, the function of these executives was still to deal with words. These words were designed to influence the public without necessarily involving any basic change of attitude or action on the part of the company. As early as 1922 the motion picture industry lured Will Hayes away from the high government office of Postmaster General to head what came to be called the Hayes Office. By 1924 the industry was maturely conscious of its obligations to the public, and representatives of more than 60 film companies met in conference to select an executive secretary to act as liaison officer in the Hayes Office. This organization functioned on a two-way basis designed to integrate the industry with the public. Every week members of the executive committee were shown a program of new films. Favorable and unfavorable criticisms were reported to the home offices of the motion picture companies, thus giving filmmakers a chance to learn what was acceptable and what was not. As a result, film entertainment was greatly improved, and during the two years in which this plan functioned the public was more friendly to the motion picture industry. That an emerging public relations concept was underway was also indicated in 1922 in a statement issued by Colonel Robert Stewart, chairman of the board of directors of the Standard Oil Company of Indiana. It is not enough to advertise a product, Colonel Stewart said public ought to be acquainted with the honesty and high character of the institution back of the product. I have always believed that one of the biggest jobs of the head of a business is to undertake definitely to deserve favorable public opinion and then to go out and win it. This is not a job that applies only to the very big corporations like ours with assets of hundreds of millions of dollars, it applies to the smaller corporations, too. If you don't have the public for you, a seriously large part of it is likely to be against you, and no business can continue to exist successfully unless a large part of the public is for it. Colonel Stewart was speaking for the oil interests, which still had reason to smart from the challenge of the muckrakers and government investigations prior to World War I. He confused publicity techniques with public relations, yet his statement of what was to be achieved fits easily into any broad definition of public relations. In 1924 the oil industry took steps to integrate itself with the public. A resolution passed by the Board of Directors of the American Petroleum Institute called for the spending of $100,000 a year to tell the public the story of oil. The use in the resolution of the term public relations, now gradually coming into vogue, was a step forward. But the basic concept of what public relations activity is was still antiquated, it was thought of simply as the distribution of information. The board's resolution recommended the appointment of a public relations committee, which, under the Institute's auspices, would assemble facts about the petroleum industry from all reliable sources and distribute these facts to the industry and the public. It is difficult to present a clear picture of the growth and development of public relations through the activities of one organization or even through the field as a whole. It is necessary in addition to examine the discussions of the functions of public relations and the development of the nomenclature used in connection with it. Without a definite idea of the dynamics in these two areas, it is difficult to appraise its activities fairly and accurately. In 1908 the American Newspaper Publishers Association, under the prodding of Don Zeitz of the New York World, initiated a campaign against so-called free publicity or free advertising. Abuses of these activities, as we have seen, had grown up from 1830 on, when advertising was a relatively new force and free space was frequently offered with it. The ANPA campaign was dropped to some extent during World War I, but when that war was over, the battle of the newspapers versus the press agent and publicity man cropped up again. It was encouraged by various trade papers such as Editor and Publisher, Printers Inc., and The Fourth Estate. There was little distinction, if any, in the mind of the editor between legitimate news and illegitimate publicity, puffs, and press agentry. The words propaganda and publicity had been given great play in World War I, mostly with bad implications. In the post-war period, the discussion centered on wartime meanings. 
Meanwhile more and more industries were moving in the direction of public relations. One issue of the Bulletin of the American Newspaper Publishers Association in 1924 attacked no less than 12 businesses and groups on the old ground of free puffs. The ANPA's attitude was an echo of the 19th century, the activities it attacked were indications of the new trend. Thus the United States Lines was attacked for setting up a press aid department, the Society for Electricity Development for offering publishers the use of its publicity service, the American Bankers Association for submitting human interest stories to the press in order to build goodwill for bankers, the J. Walter Thompson Company for sending out fashion news on behalf of a client, the Butterick Company, the India Tea Interests and the Eastman Kodak Company and Procter & Gamble for sending out news releases, the National Council for Prevention of War for its nationwide campaign to win support for its cause, the Loose Wiles Biscuit Company for its Andy Gump Cookie Campaign, the Cheney Brothers for their style service, the National Association of Insurance Agencies and NWA Year and Sun for various publicity campaigns. All this indicates, on the one hand, the continuing prejudices of certain newspaper publishers in the early 1920s against a type of publicity that was to become accepted practice. On the other hand, it gives us some idea, however sketchy, of the range of publicity and public relations techniques being used by American groups of various kinds techniques which were to expand greatly in the second half of the decade. It showed, too, immense progress over the primitive concepts of public relations with which the 20th century had opened. But there was as yet no general understanding of the principle that, in the interest of effective public relations, a client's policies and practices might have to be changed fundamentally. Public relations was still generally understood to mean the use of the overt act to build goodwill, rather than allowing basic policy and practice to be the determining factor in winning public understanding and support. The press agent was still under attack. Typical of the attacks was an editorial in the February 19, 1920, issue of Printers Inc., which, like many other statements of the period, argued that all free publicity is necessarily surreptitious and that it can function only through back-alley approaches to the editors of second-rate publications. To this unfounded charge I replied in an article entitled The Press Agent Has His Day, which appeared in Printers Inc., February 26, 1920. I pointed out that newspapers throughout the country, including the leading New York papers, depended to a certain extent on publicity organizations for news that would not otherwise come to their attention, and that they were keenly appreciative of the publicity man's efforts. The most successful American corporations and individuals have, for a long time, been employing publicity experts to present their point of view to the public and are now represented either by a personal publicity man on the staff or by a publicity organization, I added. An efficient publicity man must believe firmly in the value of advertising. No honest publicity man undertakes, under any circumstances, to promise the printing or appearance of his material. What the lawyer does for his client in the court of law, we do for our clients in the court of public opinion through the daily and periodical press. Perhaps the lack of a clear-cut terminology for public relations at that time had something to do with these attacks. This shortcoming can, I think, be illustrated very effectively through the title of a book. In 1920, George Creel told the amazing story of the Committee on Public Information, which during the war had carried the gospel of American democracy to every corner of the globe, and he called his story of America's public relations how we advertised America. The American Manufacturers Export Association in the same year published a similar account of the war activities of the Export Division of the Committee on Public Information, which I had headed, speaking of publicity and international trade, with no reference to public relations. At the same time, this article, which described how the United States influenced public opinion during the war, foreshadowed the type of activity that was later to be carried on by the Voice of America. The article urged the building up of a background of public interest in the United States and the expansion of the campaign abroad by experts who are competent to see to it that it is properly prepared in the different languages and that it reaches the proper media of distribution abroad via foreign correspondence, news services, syndicates, photo agencies, and important foreign newspapers. As I have related, in 1919 we called our organization Publicity Direction. In 1920-21, Ivy Lee, in his notes and clippings, used various terms to define his organization publicity advisor, publicity expert, publicity director, profession of publicity. In 1920 various companies had assistance to the president in charge of public relations. The following year the growing interest in the field was reflected in a list of references to publicity, with special mention of press agents, published by the Library of Congress. A bulletin issued by Ivy Lee and Associates in 1921 was titled Public Relations. That year, too, Council on Public Relations was used as the term to define our activity and contact, a booklet which we published to interpret the new field. In 1922, 
says Eric Goldman in Two Way Street. Apparently, the first use of public relations counsel was at the time of the Brene's wedding, when the groom described himself by that phrase. That the term then had great novelty was indicated in a 1922 newspaper account of a Caruso lawsuit. The story was headlined "Find New Profession in Caruso Suit Trial." The story went on. The profession of counsel on public relations made its bow in the Supreme Court before Justice Vernon M. Davis yesterday, when Edward L. Bernays introduced the new profession by declaring on the witness stand that he was such a counselor. By 1922, Herbert Bayard Swope, executive manager of the New York World, was deflating the bold cry of editor and publisher that all free publicity and all propaganda were not newsworthy. In a talk before the American Society of Newspaper Editors, he said that the element for the press to consider in publicity was that what is printed should possess news quality. Nor do I think we should be particularly worried by propaganda, Swope concluded. We, each of us, have a standard of judgment whereby we can roughly separate proper from impropaganda. His statement reflected the growing feeling that propaganda, which had acquired bad odor as a result of German propaganda aimed at the United States in World War I, might be re-established as a word with good connotations. This thought was echoed by the scientific American in this way, propaganda in its proper meaning is a perfectly wholesome word of honest parentage and with an honorable history. The New York Times, too, joined in, that propaganda has come to be a word of ill repute reflects on the intelligence of the reading public. No man can open his mouth on a subject which affects his own interest without emitting propaganda, no matter how impartial he may try to be. Most of us unconsciously recognize this by our rule of thumb method of judging what we hear, if it agrees with our prejudices, it is true, if not, it is propaganda. So the distinction between propaganda and information is logically almost impossible to draw, though in practice there is a difference. In that year, also, Walter Lippmann, in public opinion, gave new meaning to the discussion of the field by introducing the term stereotype as a picture of things we have in our heads. This gave a broader background to the meaning of public opinion and what tended to build it up. In the year 1922 the distinction between counsel on public relations and publicity man was being recognized. The recognition was sketchy, but from an authoritative source, the fourth estate, which said editorially. Counsel on public relations and director of public relations are two terms that the newspaper man is encountering more often every day. There is a familiar tinge to them in a way but in justice to the men who bear these titles, and to the concerns that employ them, it should be said that they are or can be disassociated from the old idea of publicity man. The very fact that many of the largest corporations in the country are recognizing the need of maintaining right relationships with the public is alone important enough to assure a fair and even favorable hearing for their public relations departments. Whether a man is really entitled to the Appalachian Council on Public Relations, or whether he should merely be called publicity man, rests entirely with the individual and the firm that employs him. As we see it, a man who is really counsel or director of public relations has one of the most important jobs on the roster of any concern, but a man who merely represents the old idea of getting something for nothing from publishers is about passé. No one kept track of the changes in public relations nomenclature more closely than the indefatigable H. L. Mencken. In 1925 his Americana used press agent and publicist interchangeably. Every politician, movie actor, actress and prize fight, he said, has a publicist. In 1926 the first edition of Mencken's American language took account of the new manifestation in the field, but treated the change as a mere euphemism. A press agent, he said, is now called a publicist, a press representative or a counsel on public relations, just as a realtor and mortician are euphemisms for real estate man and undertaker. Twenty years later, however, in Supplement No. 1 of American Language, Mencken devoted two pages to the term public relations counsel, incorporating our definition of it. The growing recognition of the development of the profession and the new nomenclature is further demonstrated by R. H. Wilder and K. L. Buell's book, Publicity, published in 1923. The authors envisage the growth and development of the field. They referred to the frequent use of publicity agent and publicity manager, and said that some financial and commercial organizations gave these people such titles as goodwill engineer or counselor in public relations but that there were others who seemed so afraid of being accused of bidding for popularity that they gave their publicity manager the all-embracing title of vice president. Their discussion indicates there was still a lack of true understanding of the two-way function of public relations. Comment on public relations swung between old-fashioned concepts and recognition of new developments. Abram Lipsky's book, Man the Puppet, The Art of Controlling Minds, published in 1925, saw the public relations council only as a new Pied Piper who was the old press agent in new guise. Two important newspapers, on the other hand, 
recognized the new trend. In 1924 the Chicago Tribune editorially emphasized that public relations was becoming a profession, an art, and a science and urged the business executive that in seeking the cooperation of the public he should first of all give the fullest cooperation to his public relations department. This, the editorial concluded, means utter frankness, access to all facts, and speed. So, too, the New York Herald of February 11, 1926, declared that the old-time press agent has gone, and that with the emergence of the Public Relations Council there was a refinement not only of title but of methods. To clarify the situation, our own office attempted to work out a definition of Council on Public Relations that might be accepted by the profession and the public. We published our definition in the form of a full advertisement that appeared in the January 26, 1927, issue of Editor and Publisher. It read as follows. Council on Public Relations A Definition What is a Council on Public Relations and what are his relations to the press of this country? A Council on Public Relations directs, advises upon, and supervises those activities of his client which affect or interest the public. He interprets the client to the public and the public to his client. He concerns himself with every contact with the public wherever and whenever it may arise. He creates circumstances and events in advising a client upon his public activities. And he disseminates information about circumstances in helping his client to make his case known to his public. This was again a reaffirmation of the twofold function of the Public Relations Council, whose profession it is to integrate groups, industries, and individuals with society, to disseminate facts and points of view to and from society. As the field of public relations continued to expand and mature, an attempt was made in 1927 to organize public relations men into a professional association. This attempt, however, was abortive, it failed because it received too much premature publicity. In 1927, editor and publisher was particularly annoyed at the claim we made that the Public Relations Council is justified in affecting circumstances before they happen to make the news. And in the same year it reported that the ANPA was initiating a new war on press agents, with S.E. Thomason, publisher of the Tampa Tribune, launching the attack. Conversely, the interest sociologists were beginning to take in the subject was shown in that same year. In a topical summary of current literature in the American Journal of Sociology, Robert S. Park, in a bibliography of the newspaper press, said, no account of the newspaper and its relation to public affairs would be complete without some reference to the press agent. Evidence that propaganda was not the horrid word it had become during World War I and, and that attempts were being made to establish its better meaning was indicated the same year in a report by the Universal Trade Press, the verdict of public opinion on propaganda. The verdict was favorable. Once again I tried to present the two-way principle of public relations in an article entitled This Business of Propaganda, which appeared in the September, 1928, issue of The Independent. In this article I emphasized that professional ethics required the propagandist or the public relations council never to represent or plead in the court of public opinion a cause which he believes is socially unsound, never to take the cases of conflicting clients, and always to maintain the same standards of truth with media as govern the habits of the world he lives in. The year 1928 also saw the first recognition of public relations on the part of the social sciences. The May issue of the American Journal of Sociology broke ground in this respect with my article on manipulating public opinion. It discussed the problem from the standpoint of attempting to modify attitudes of the public, with particular reference to overcoming the inertia of established traditions and prejudices. That was the year I published my second book Propaganda. Its title was significant in two ways, for one thing, toward the end of the 20s the term propaganda had lost the negative connotation it had acquired in World War I. Also, the emphasis of public relations at that time was more on articulation than on integration. Yet the two-way principle was stressed, too. If the public is better informed about the processes of its own life, I wrote in propaganda, it will be so much the more receptive to reasonable appeals to its own interests. No matter how sophisticated, how cynical the public may become about publicity methods, it must respond to the basic appeals, if the public becomes more intelligent in its commercial demands, commercial firms will meet the new standards. As for articulation, the new propaganda, having regard to the constitution of society as a whole, not infrequently serves to focus and realize the desires of the masses. A desire for a specific reform, however widespread, cannot be translated into action until it is made articulate, and until it has exerted sufficient pressure upon the proper lawmaking bodies. Millions of housewives may feel that manufactured goods deleterious to health should be prohibited. But there is little chance that their individual desires will be translated into effective legal form unless their half-expressed demand can be organized, made vocal, 
and concentrated upon the state legislature or the federal Congress in some mode which will produce the results of their desires. Whether they realize it or not, they call upon propaganda to organize and effectuate their demand. I also pointed out that the new profession of public relations counsel has grown up because of the increasing complexity of modern life and the consequent necessity for making the actions of one part of the public understandable to other sectors of the public. A new note was introduced into public relations by urging that public relations practitioners be familiar with the findings of the social sciences, which do so much to clarify the nature of our society and the operations of public opinion. Since then, investigation into the social sciences has grown tremendously and new techniques have been developed for measuring public attitudes. By this time there was already established in the minds of the leaders of American public opinion an understanding of the difference between a council on public relations and a publicity man. Also beginning to be understood was the twofold function of the Council on Public Relations as we had tried to define it, an expert who advises his clients on attitudes and actions to fit them better into the society of which they are a part, a practitioner of the art of making known to the publics upon which the client is dependent his policies and practices. In that same year, 1928, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company issued a report of a survey, entitled Functions of a Public Relations Council, which indicated that while public relations had gained great acceptance during this decade, there were still very few independent practitioners it mentioned only Ivy Lee and ourselves. And a year later, Ernest Elmo Calkins, distinguished advertising executive, writing in the Saturday Review of Literature, said, The war taught us the new possibilities of molding public opinion, improve the machinery, and transform the old-time press agent into the modern public relations council, whose clients are colleges, cathedrals, corporations, societies, and even nations. But Stanley Walker, city editor of the New York Herald Tribune, still talked about the expert tribe of propagandists and space grabbers. An editor and publisher was still hammering away, Public Relations Council was a dangerous device because they were irresponsible, and calculated to break down advertising practices. Through 1929, editor and publisher kept it up. One story was headlined 500 Grafters. One of the most disgraceful documents ever published in any industry recently was issued by ANPA. It listed 500 brand articles of merchandise which are being press agented in grafted space in newspapers. The continuing battle was marked by the organization of a New York City Publishers Bureau to stem the deluge of puffery, as editor and publisher called it. The New Yorker of November 9, 1929, was still unwilling to accept the title Council on Public Relations. It had a new name specialist in making news events. Other magazines, however, were quoting the concept outlined in Propaganda, that the function of a public relations council was to interpret clients' interest to the public and the public to the client. All in all, the decade from 1919 to 1929 marked a turning point in the development of public relations. As in the case of other fields, that development did not proceed in a straight line. Horse and buggy ideas of propaganda and publicity left over from the 90s operated side by side with the whitewashing and the public be informed ideas of 1906 and the modern techniques stimulated by World War I propaganda and now applied on a broader basis to peacetime pursuits. And, as is always true of any new process, there was a cultural time lag between the latest advances and earlier notions. That was why discussion of public relations in the 1920s followed a zigzag course. While certain corporations were moving toward a more advanced concept of public relations and this concept was being broadened through books and university courses, opposition to public relations continued along old lines on the assumption that it was nothing more than old-fashioned press agentry. But if developments in the 20s reveal anything, they reveal that public relations was a new field, distinct from old-fashioned press agentry and publicity, and that important sections of American society business, education, and the press were beginning to recognize this fact.